Greetings and welcome to another edition of the Creation Corner with your host David McNabb. And uh, this is the second show we're doing with uh, David Larson uh, on the Ark and the Search for the Ark and Noah's Flood, uh, which is uh, in Genesis 6 to 9. Uh, so I highly recommend you uh, go and read that. But first, it's time for a wee bit of humor. A teenage boy had just passed his driving test and inquired of his father as to when they could discuss his use of the car. His father said he'd make a deal with his son. Son, you, you bring up your grades from a C to a B average, study your Bible, and get your hair cut. And then we'll talk about the car. And the boy thought about that for a moment, decided he'd settle for the offer, and they agreed on it. After about six weeks, his father said, son, you've... You've brought your grades up, and I've observed that you have been studying your Bible, but I'm disappointed that you haven't cut your hair. Uh, the boy said, you know, Dad, I've been thinking about that, and I've noticed in my studies of the Bible that Samson had long hair, John the Baptist had long hair, Moses had long hair, and there's even strong evidence that Jesus had long hair. You're, and you're going to love this reply. Dad said, did you also notice that they walked everywhere they went? There's a, a, a good re, rejoinder, rejoinder right there, don't you think? Okay, um, uh, my, for my recommendation for a resource, a creation resource this time, it's going to be uh, Dinosaurs on the Ark by my guest today, David Larson. I've read this and I thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, you can get it through me uh, and it's a $20 book or you can go to David Larson's website uh, and uh, that'll be on the screen, and you can get it directly from him. And he's down in Phoenix, and, uh, you know, he uh, is a, a science and math teacher. Uh, now, I, I, I like science, but math, I just could never, could never get my head around math. And, in fact, I've got a shirt at home that says, Another day without using higher math. Thank the Lord, huh? But... I guess David uh, just seems to love this math business and, and of course, the science. And so we're going to hear more from an educated guy, not, not me, uh, David Larson, about the ark and the search for the ark. So, David, thank you for joining me again. Thank you. Second show yeah. we're doing on uh, the ark. And uh, you, you are, ex this is what you're an expert at. You've been doing this for how many years? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I've been reading and researching for over 45 years. My first actual trip to Turkey and climbing the mountain was in 1997. So that makes it... 1997, okay. So that's uh, 23 years yeah. ago. Okay, very good. Uh, see, I can do the lower math. It's just the higher math that I have problems with. Um, you realize that Isaac Newton was known as a physicist, and he invented calculus to do physics. So I hear. So they go hand yeah. in glove. Yeah, that's right. There's some <laughs> Scottish guy named Ramsey, I think, that invented some uh, calculus or something yeah. there. Yeah. Okay, uh, now we have in front of us here the, the arc. Now you created this model. Correct. It's to an N scale. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, how do you describe N scale? Well, I... N scale is the there's based two main scales for model railroads. One is N scale, then there's H O scale. Those are the miniature scales, and N scale is the smaller one. So I don't remember off the top of my head what the numbers are one to one hundred and thirty seven or something like that. But okay. I I specifically created the mo the model at, at that scale so that I could find animals at the model railroad shops or online that were made to that scale. Um, okay. And I put the model and railroad in there just for, to give you an idea of how enormous a structure this was. Now, biblically, it says it was 300 cubits long. And a cubit could be, generally speaking, from 18 inches, a foot and a half, up to 24 inches. So the minimum length of the arc is 450 feet. So that's what I built this at 
just for conservative okay. purposes. It could okay, have that's been eighteen inch scale, right? It could have been cubit. up to six hundred feet long, so it could have been significantly longer than right. this model. That's right. No, a cubit was the length between your elbow and the top of your finger. Correct. Okay, so that could vary, obviously. That could vary, right. And uh, we have the Egyptian cubit, and we have, uh, uh, what, what was it, the other one, Sumatran? Or not, uh, do you remember what the other one's called? I don't know. But, there's, but there are different uh, cubit lengths uh, that's been recorded over time. And uh, so you did the, the minimum, so 450 feet would be a minimum of length. And what about the width and the, and the height? Um, of course, the, the dimensions are given in the scripture in cubits, in, translated into English. Um, the New International converts it to, the ark is 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet high. 75 so feet wide, 45, 45 feet, feet high. high means a minimum of 15 feet per story. So it, God told them to build it in three levels, a lower, middle, and upper levels. And if you've ever seen a um, semi-truck going down the freeway with cattle in the back or sheep in the back, they're not just at the ground floor. They have multiple decks in the truck, so they have sheep at multiple levels. Well, I'm sure that that's what the ark was like. They didn't have just cows and then 15 feet of empty space above them. They had cages that were stacked. Um, there was a story that came out of the Smithsonian Institute back in the late 60s, um, and it's apocryphal because it can't be confirmed at this point, but David Duckworth was a worker at the Smithsonian, and he claimed that the National Geographic and the Smithsonian Institute did a joint expedition to find Noah's Ark. And he said that they came back with much hubbaloo, uh, hullabaloo about finding the Ark, and they had pictures of it, and they had artifacts that they brought back from eastern Turkey. And one day he was let into this room where they were gathered around a table with the photographs laid out, and he saw the photographs of this huge wooden ship, and he asked one of the um, paleontologists, scientists that were there, if he really believed that they had discovered Noah's Ark. And his answer is what I found interesting because the, the gentleman said, I've always ridiculed this story based on the fact that eight people could never have cared for all of those animals for over a year's time in the ship. He goes, when I saw the way the cages were built around centralized locations with watering mechanisms and feeding mechanisms, he said it was brilliant. They did it. So I don't know how you would make that story up unless you were well versed in the technology and the, but it just always it's one of the reasons that I've just um, I ha I've had a former student who went on to become a shipbuilder built wooden ships yachts and and I met with him in San Francisco for dinner one time and we talked about what I was doing and he got out his calculator did math on the spot and said it's impossible we can't make a wooden ship that big it, it wouldn't survive the waves um, and I reminded him that, of course, the trees that were before the flood were different than after the flood. They were bigger, stronger, denser, uh, but also that Noah had technology that was revealed to him by God. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, right. one of my goals in finding the ark and getting into it was just to reveal the technology that was utilized to build the ark. And mm -hmm. I think that alone is going to be fascinating and blow people's minds. Yes. Now, the ark didn't have to, it wasn't going anywhere. It just had to float. Correct. And uh, my understanding is that the dimension of the ark is the perfect dimension for surviving turbulent waters and floating. Yeah, and they, I mean, building a ship out of wood that big is what modern shipbuilders would say it, it can't be made strong enough. But the dimensions are perfect. Um, uh, there was a Navy shipbuilder in World War II who was a Christian and built a destroyer based on the proportions of the Ark, and it turned out to be their most stable ship ever. It wasn't fast, but it, it was virtually unsinkable. Right. Um, and I was told the story of the Bethesda Naval Academy. They had a shipbuilding class, and their final project in one of the classes was 
to build the most stable ship that they could. And now they're building at you know, scale. And the professor gave them the length. He said, it has to be this long, but you can make it any width, any shape, any height. And one of the groups decided to use the dimensions of the ark. And so when they brought it in, of course, the class snickered and people laughed. But they have a wave-generating tank that they put the ships in, and it sank every ship in the class with the exception of the ark. And they couldn't sink the ark as big as the waves they could make. They were not able to sink it. We're laughing so, anymore, huh? No. So somebody <laughs> okay. clearly knew what they were doing when they created the dimensions of the ark. Oh, yes, absolutely. So, now, I, I want to go back to that first story that you were telling us about. Uh, with, it was in 1960? It was in the late 60s, I believe. The late 60s that yeah. this expedition happened. Do you remember who was on this expedition or were, who funded it? or anything? I, I don't. Well, it was a joint expedition, according to David Duckworth, who was a security guard there between the joint, uh, National Geographic Society and the Smithsonian Institute. Okay. So now, those couple at, biggies. At the same time, you have to remember... The Smithsonian Institute was building the Museum of Natural History in Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. and painting on the wall the mural of the evolution of life from the primordial slime becoming eventually right. mankind. Somebody had to realize these two stories are incompatible, right. and they squashed the one of the ark. Now, I've always hoped that when I get into the ark, I find a matchbook from the Smithsonian Institute so I can show it publicly to prove that they were there, that they knew it. Uh, but that story can't be proved. Um, they denied it, of course. And Right. And, and those are a couple of very um, pro-evolution yeah. and probably atheistic uh, organizations uh, that we have in America that, and, and around the world uh, that um, they would be embarrassed uh, yeah. if the Ark was found. Yeah. Unfortunately, National Geographic in particular has sunk hundreds of millions of dollars into promoting the story of evolution and dinosaurs yeah. evolving into birds. Um, year, several years ago, maybe 10 or 12 years ago, they had a cover story published that they had found a fossilized dinosaurs with feathers. And that confirmed their story that dinosaurs evolved into birds. Right. And it turned out that that was a hoax, mm -hmm. that Somebody had literally glued pieces of rock together and sold it. I think it was for $3 million. Don't quote me on the price, but National Geographic paid a lot of money for that dinosaur fossil with feathers. No doubt. And it was a hoax. Right. So the next article, one month later, after it had been clearly revealed to be a hoax, they didn't have a cover article. That story of evolution of dinosaurs into birds was a hoax. Sorry, we were wrong. Nothing about it. There's one little one paragraph blurb that said something to the effect it appears that that specific fossil may not be legitimate, but the story is still true. <laughs> Dinosaurs evolved in Of birds. course it is. Right. Believe so, us, we know what we're talking about. We yeah. have PhDs after all. Correct. Okay. Well, uh, now, the Bible says the ark was made out of gopher wood. What's yeah. gopher wood? That's uh, wood that Noah had to gopher. That's right. It wasn't right in the area. Go for that, that wood, boys. <laughs> Nobody knows exactly. Some have speculated that it may have been a type of process of making it like plywood, gluing sheets together to reinforce and make it stronger. Um, it was clearly a, a dense wood, something like oak that was hard and dense and big. We know that from the fossil record, there were trees that grew much larger before the flood, like animals did, like people did before the flood. Yeah. So they, okay. but we don't know exactly what gopher wood is. Right. And there's been different um, ideas about how long it took Noah and his mm -hmm. three sons to build the ark. Uh, do you have a, a, an idea on that? I do. Um, I do not think, as many people say, that it was 120 years. Um, and I'll tell you why scripturally. Um, Genesis 6.3 is the verse that many people refer to. And in Genesis 6.3, God is telling them that um, when men began to increase in number on the earth and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful and they married any of them they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit will not contend with man forever, for he is mortal, 
His days will be 120 years. Some verses say his, his evil. Um, and there are basically two words in the Hebrew that are not fully, completely understood. So there's a couple different possible renderings of that. I believe that that verse is speaking of the lifespan of man. That's what it sounds like to me. Yeah. And it's because of man's evil. It says that God saw that man's evil, heart was evil all the time. And if you recall, I mean, if, if you could imagine in the modern world, Adolf Hitler living to be 950 years old and being in control of Europe, the atrocities that he would have committed in 950 years. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's an act of God's mercy that he physiologically made changes that limited the lifespan of man to a maximum of 120 years. And I've, I've had that confirmed to me in a number of ways. I spoke at a church in Southern California and an ophthalmologist came up to me afterwards and said, I've never heard that verse interpreted that way, but I just came from a conference and the leading ophthalmologist, the keynote speaker at the event said this, he said, I have studied the human eye for my entire career, and I have come to the conclusion that it was genetically engineered to have a lifespan of 120 years. He said, if maximum, man, lifespan. maximum lifespan. If mm -hmm. man could somehow be allowed, be enabled to live longer than that, they would all be blind. Mm -hmm. Now, he didn't say created, he said genetically engineered, but I take that to mean created. Right. It has a, a specific lifespan, but that's mm -hmm. true of the human body across the board. Um, my um, doctor in Southern California, when we, were, we talked about this, and he brought out an article from Yale Medical School, and they had done a study on the human brain, and they came to exactly the same conclusion, that it could not be extended beyond 120 years. That's its maximum lifespan. Okay. So that tells me that that that's not the time that Noah had to build the ark. And I take information from the fact that Noah is the only patriarch in all of Genesis who was 500 years old before his first son was born. Everyone else was 200, 180. Some were 65 when their first son was born through whom their lineage was traced. But Noah was 500. And it's because God made that pronouncement before the flood that the lifespan of man was going to be affected in the generation of the sons of Noah. And if you look at the genealogies in Scripture, you'll see that from Adam all the way through Noah, it's virtually a horizontal line. And the average age is 930 years. When you get to Noah, it immediately goes into an exponential decay curve. It's a mathematical curve that oh, you can figure no. out the exponential rate of decay. Math really has to come into this? It does indeed. Oh. Because it turns out that there's no, I, 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 there's a man named Hugh Ross who has a ministry called Reasons to Believe. Um, smart guy, but he's a scientist who came to Christianity late in life, later in life, and he's tried to fit his conception of science into the Bible. In order secular to, conception. Secular conception. Yeah, so right. in order to do that, he has to say there was not a global flood. Mm -hmm. There was a flood, because he can't deny that, but it was in the Mesopotamian Valley. It was a local event. And basically, in, I'm paraphrasing, but Noah built the ark and had cows on it and pigs on it so they could have food after the flood. But the reality is, even according to the shortest version that it took him 120 years to build the ark, he could have moved anywhere in the world multiple times over without taking any animals with him and could have found the animals wherever he needed them, according to the Hugh Ross version of events. If the flood only covered the Mesopotamian Valley, there was no reason to build an ark whatsoever. Sure. He could have just moved. He could have moved. He packed a suitcase. It's <laughs> way right. easier. Sure. So he says that the word for year before the flood was actually meant month. So instead of Noah living 950 years, he lived 950 months, which makes him, I don't have my calculator in my head, but he makes him in his 80s, something like that. Um, eight times 12 is 96, so he would have been somewhere near 80. And that, to Hugh Ross, seems reasonable. 
But the problem is that there are people in that same genealogy who had their first son when they were 65. If that's months, he was five and a half months old, five and a half years old when he had his first son. Doesn't work, Hugh. That doesn't work. That's physiologically impossible. <laughs> right. But in the generations that follow the flood, Noah's first son, Shem, his lifespan is reduced by almost 40% from Noah. I think it's 37%. So it immediately begins to... Now Noah lived 600 years before the flood and 350 years after the flood. So whatever happened to the environment at the flood did not affect Noah. He lived as long or longer than anyone in the scriptures up to that point, right. Right. with the exception of Methuselah, who right. was 969, I believe. Mm -hmm. So it only affected Noah's sons. And from that point on, it drops off exponentially in a nice mathematical curve that you can plot the decay rate of. Someone had to either be a very intelligent mathematician to make up that plot, or they were recording what really happened. But for Hugh Ross's version of it, there's no place in that curve to fit in the change between month and year. It doesn't work anywhere. Mm -hmm. Abraham, who is eight generations removed from the flood, by the way, was a contemporary of the son of Noah. Shem died two years before Abraham. So they likely knew each other and even shared the stories of the flood and the ark. Abraham lived 175 years. Virtually all biblical scholars accept the historicity and the reality of Abraham today, mm -hmm. but no one talks about him living 175 years. That's right. That's way beyond anyone mm -hmm. today. The mm -hmm. oldest person on earth today is less than 120. And in fact, I read in America last year, I think it was, or two years ago, the oldest known woman died at 117, and her daughter had died the year before that at 98. Mm -hmm. So... Mm -hmm. Even if anyone lived to 121, it would be the extreme exception. But the lifespan that God put into man was 120 years, and that was the maximum. Yeah. So I think that Noah had 500 years to build the ark. And it was his life's calling. It was okay. his mission okay. to build this ark. And stories that, that eyewitnesses have told of the construction of the ark say, this would have been an incredibly long and difficult process. Yes, um, it would have been. And of course, he had the three big, strong boys. And uh, we don't know, it doesn't say, but uh, he could have uh, hired a crew to certainly. construct it as well. Yeah. Um, he undoubtedly had help, but I think that it, it was his life's calling and his life's mission. And that's what he did. Right. So. And the Ark has uh, three... Uh, stories, as you mentioned, uh -huh. and uh, lots of uh, animals uh, and dinosaurs you see coming onto the ark here that God brought. Uh, Noah did Correct. not have to go out and, and get those animals because God brought them to the ark uh, to go on. Um, now, even dinosaurs, as um, you mentioned in the first show, uh, would not have been full-grown dinosaurs. We're, we're speculating here, but we, it's just logical to think that, it, that they would have been um, uh, young dinosaurs, and um, so that, that they're not, you know, full grown and, and huge, taking up all the space, so much space on the ark. Now, uh, the there's a lot of small dinosaurs that we don't normally see because they're not as dramatic as the big ones. Uh, but the average size of a dinosaur is only the size of a large sheep or a small pony. Right. So and that's full grown. That's full grown. Right. Okay. So we're not. Um, talking about uh, the, the tremendous amount of space here. Now, there is a lot of space in this ark. The minimum is 450 feet long here by 75 wide and um, uh, 45 high. Okay, uh, so we've, and there's, we've got uh, all kinds of cages in here that we would have. Uh, how, what's your speculation on now, the, the, the amount of animals that would have been here? Because the Bible talks about uh, two of each kind. It doesn't say two of each species. So it wouldn't have to have all 350 types of dogs on there. You would just have to have one type of dog, right? Right. I, I, I don't know if you, if you know Kent Hovind. Um, some refer to him as Dr. Dino. Um, my favorite answer, years ago he was invited to do a debate at an Eastern University and they couldn't find a biology professor willing to debate him. 
but they asked if he would be comfortable with people from the audience asking him questions. And he said, sure. So he did his talk, and a biology professor in the audience raised his hand and said, so Dr. Hoven, you are telling us that you believe that all 250 species of dogs or varieties of dogs came from one pair on the ark? And Dr. Hoven said, well, aren't you expecting us to believe that they all came from a rock? And I thought that was brilliant. Um, but the reality is we know through artificial selection that there's a lot of genetic information in the dog variety and we have taken that information and we have separated out what we like. If we find a dog that has white fur and black spots, we separate it out, we isolate it, we find another one that has similar characteristics and we mate them and then we weed out the ones from their offspring that don't match that. And eventually, through several generations, we produce the Dalmatian. Well, we know that information was in the dog kind to begin with. Mm -hmm. We didn't produce new information. And what we did is eliminate information that was there in the dog kind. So all these varieties of dogs are not new evolutionary links. They are they're information that has been lost. Yeah. And dog breeders are now discovering that they have lost information in the dog kind that is detrimental to the population of dogs as a whole. Mm -hmm. That when they're allowed to interbreed with different varieties of dogs, it actually strengthens the dogs. And Dalmatians yeah. are susceptible to certain diseases. German Shepherds have hip d disease. And um, so that's the antithesis of evolution. It's right. really, when they call it microevolution, it's re really micro de evolution because it's information that's lost. Yes. And you're talking and about genetic information. Genetic information that's, that's not recoverable right. That's right. unless you allow them to intermate once again. Okay. So yes, you didn't. But remember that scripture says that many of the animals, the clean animals and the birds were brought onto the ark, not in twos, but in fourteens. God says that you are to bring in seven pairs of the clean animals. So animals that would have been utilized after the flood for food, for using shearing lambs for clothing, okay. for cloth, for, uh, were brought in yeah. larger numbers. Is the wording clear that it was seven pairs rather than seven? Well, I believe so because in the Hebrew it literally says seven, seven, a male and its mate. Well, you can't bring seven animals onto the ark, a male and its mate. It doesn't say that in twos. It doesn't say two twos. It says two animals, unclean, a male and its mate. But when it refers to seven, it says seven sevens, a male and its mate. So it's okay. seven males and seven females. Okay. So I, I believe, without looking at it, that New International translates it as 14. Um, okay. okay, so that... It's not real clear, but it, it right. makes a little more sense to, to say that probably what they're saying there is 14 instead of yeah. 7. And it does make, to me, it makes clear that all the animals that came onto the ark were brought in pairs, a male matched with a female. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you can't do that with seven animals. Okay, so uh, about how many kinds of dinosaurs are there? Or were there, I should say. Yeah, that's difficult to say because we don't know how the fossils fit together. And in a lot of instances, like for example, the Brontosaurus, they created this dinosaur they called the Brontosaurus, and then they claimed, oh, we put the head from the wrong dinosaur on it, and then they called it the Apatosaurus, and now they're back to calling it the Brontosaurus. So in, if, if we found 300 dog fossils, a Dalmatian, a Chihuahua, a Great Dane, a, we would have no idea that they're all one kind. So we might create 300 different animals out of them. So it's very difficult to say how many specific varieties or kinds of dinosaurs there were, but okay. most estimates say there were roughly 50,000 animals on the ark. Okay, so you're, you're saying that about 50,000 is the number that would have been on the ark. Correct. And, and that's because you, there wouldn't have been the, the various species of a kind, it would just been the original kind. Correct. That then, after they got off the ark, uh, then those species, um, uh, because of the genetic variation uh, that's in the gene pool, uh, would have uh, come about. Correct. Uh, okay. Um, so about fifty thousand, and 
I, I think Dr. Hoven um, says there's about 50 types or kinds of dinosaurs, if I'm not wrong on that. Correct. Uh, so, um, you know, you are an, an expert on a lot of things, but you actually went to search for the ark, was it 13 times? You've been to Mount Era? I believe so at this point, yeah. It looks like we're running out of time, but, okay. so that might so, be a story for another day. But yeah, so I have climbed I, the mountain six times. I've been there 13 times. been there 13 times, climbed the mountain six times. Uh, folks, we are almost out of time. So uh, we are going to have another show with David Larson, who is going to explain about his experiences on Mount Ararat searching for the Ark himself. First-hand uh, testimony about what is it like to search for the ark, to go on a, a, over a 17,000-foot mount, uh, mountain to search for this ark and to find it uh, in incredibly difficult circumstances uh, that, that he's encountered and that everyone has encountered uh, who has actually been on Mount Ararat to search for, this, for the ark. Uh, and uh, there's lots more uh, around this story to tell. So I hope you will come back on another time uh, to, uh, in our next show, to hear about this, the actual search for the Ark, what was found, and how was it found uh, by David Larson, who has been there 13 times and who has searched on the mountain six times himself uh, with uh, some other folks. So... That will be really interesting, and i uh, love to have you come back and, and uh, see that as well. And David, thank you for being my guest again on this show. Uh, it was welcome. wonderful talking with you. Thank you. And uh, again, you're a teacher, a uh, high school teacher in uh, Phoenix, and people can get a hold of you um, uh, through your website, correct? Correct. Okay, yeah. and uh, the website will be on the screen. So take that information down, check it out, and you're free to contact him uh, at some point uh, as well. Uh, so, so, uh, so glad to have you again, and uh, God bless uh, all of you uh, who is watching today. God bless you.